110 feet beneath the surface of the Mediterranean, a diver comes across the entrance to a hidden tunnel in the cliffs. The tunnel leads to a storehouse of prehistoric art, last seen by human eyes more than 500 generations ago. Now archaeologists are uncovering new meanings behind these masterpieces of cave art, helping us to understand the thinking of our ancestors far back in the Ice Age. I'm John Rhys Davis. Join me as we explore the secrets of the cave beneath the sea. Next on Archaeology. There are a few stranger stories of archaeological discovery. A cavern lies hidden at the end of a long, murky underwater tunnel. Inside, what appear to be prehistoric paintings rivaling those of the famous Lascaux cave. Never before has such a range of animal depictions been found in a single cave. The first diver to brave the tunnel was a man named Henri Cosquer and his bold act of discovery gave the cavern its name, Kosker Cave. The secret cave with its haunting paintings was a provocative find. Could someone, uh, Kosker for instance, have faked the artwork as a publicity stunt? If the paintings were real, what were they doing in a cave almost sealed off from the outside world? And above all, what could the mysterious images mean? Henri Kosker is an instructor at a diving school near Marseille. In 1985, he chanced on his extraordinary find. Uh, la découverte de la grotte. Uh the discovery of the cave was a simple matter i was on a pleasure dive with some clients when i noticed this hole in the rock so i entered a little ways to see if the tunnel continued or was a dead end i then stopped my exploration and continued the dive with my clients telling myself i would come back to see where this hole led Où allait ce trou et est-ce qu'il y avait un prolongement de galerie quelque part? Kosker later returned by himself with equipment especially designed for the risky art of underwater caving. He swam down to the submerged tunnel and found it did indeed continue on through the cliffs. But it was just a few feet wide, too narrow to turn around it. And if he brushed his flipper against the bottom, it filled with blinding silt. Still, he pressed on for another 450 feet, praying that the tunnel would eventually widen out. Finally, 12 long minutes after he began his nerve-wracking swim, he broke through the surface of the water. Astonished, he found himself in an underground cave 180 feet long. And he was even more amazed when he saw faded images on the wall. The first drawing I saw was a hand on the wall. And the first reaction I had on seeing this was, who'd come here to do a crazy thing like this? I was alone. There was no one to pinch me. When I came out, I told my brother I had taken a photo. We'll see tomorrow when it's developed. For several years, the hidden cave remained a secret entrusted to Kosker's brother and just a handful of his fellow divers. They helped him photograph dozens more paintings of hands and animals, and he realized these could not be modern graffiti. 
He knew he had to tell French archaeologists of his find, but only one of them had the skills to follow him through the tunnel. That archaeologist was Jean Cotin, a prehistorian as well as an experienced diver. Well, some 20 years ago, I worked and explored underwater caves in exactly the same area to find habitats that had been submerged after the last glaciation. There were no specialists in cave art, no prehistorian who could dive, particularly in underwater caves. So I was approached to check out the grotto. Cortin dived into the cavern and was astonished by the animal paintings and engravings he saw. There were more than 40 of them, some familiar enough, like the horse, deer, and bison, but others more exotic, such as the long-extinct giant Irish elk, recognizable by the hump on its back. Most surprising of all were these birds that at first glance seemed to be penguins, quite out of place in the Mediterranean of today. Now they're believed to be images of the great orc, a docile, flightless seabird that stood nearly three feet high. To bring a scientist into the cave was a fantastic experience for me. To witness this discovery with someone who has worked all of his life on prehistory, to share this moment, was an incredibly emotional experience. I was guided by Henri all the way through the tunnel. When you emerge into the cave and you see all these stalactites, the paintings and the etchings, you forget the difficult tunnel passage. To collaborate in the study of the paintings, one of France's leading cave art specialists, Jean Clot, was called in. I didn't go into the cave, of course, uh, because uh, I'm not a diver, but uh, I can say I've been inside the cave, uh, let's say, three the photo through the photographs and also through the eyes of my friend Jean Cortet and uh, also through um, the camera, the television camera, when uh, I monitored whatever was going on inside the cave for a whole afternoon. There were several unusual things about the paintings. No cave art site had ever been found in Provence, far from the main concentrations of well-known painted caves in France and Spain, such as Lascaux and Altamira. Although images of seals, like those in the Cosca cave, had been found on engraved prehistoric objects, the great orc paintings were unique. Understandably, some experts doubted the authenticity of the paintings. The difficulty of getting into the cave makes it hard to imagine that the forger could be a diver, a specialist in cave art, and an artist all at the same time. When you examine on site the etchings and the paintings, I saw the calcite drippings, the crystallizations that formed very slowly and covered the lines of both etchings and paintings. It proved their antiquity and the fact that they are genuine. Cortin radiocarbon dated the animal paintings to between 18 and 19,000 years ago. They were older than the art at Lascaux. He was even more surprised when he obtained a much older date for the hands, 27,000 years. At the moment, it is the oldest dating in the world for a known prehistoric painting. So the carbon dating evidence showed that there had been two separate periods of human activity within the cave, both far back in the late Ice Age. A time when the climate in southern Europe was much colder and drier than at present, when extinct animals such as mammoths roamed Europe's vast windy prairies alongside more familiar animals, reindeer, horse, bison and muskox. A time when the mile-high ice sheets spread down from the polar region, burying much of the landscape of northern Europe. There was so much ocean water locked up in the ice that the world's sea levels dropped by over 300 feet. So what is now a submerged tunnel leading to the cave drawings was, 27,000 years ago, 
a dry passageway leading from a cave mouth several miles inland. It would still have been a difficult crawl to reach the paintings, but not life-threatening. But just who were the artists? In the Ice Age, uh, the people who lived uh, in these valleys uh, were primarily hunters and gatherers. Uh, and their life was very much tied up with the, the game. But there might be, there may have been different uh, subsistence strategies. Uh, some might have been tied to a herd of reindeer, for example, and uh, follow them along, kill one from now and then, and so depend mostly on the reindeer. And uh, others may have exploited a particular place for some length of time and then moved on. So there may have been really different uh, ways of uh, exploiting the natural environment because we must always keep in mind that the, the world at the time was full of animals and nearly empty of men. But the paintings and carvings in Casca Cave were more than a simple picture gallery of the wildlife on which these Ice Age hunters depended. Scholars have proposed dozens of different theories to explain these complex and beautiful images. A number of years ago, when prehistorians began to discover cave art, there was talk of hunting magic. Man would cast spells on the animals which he wanted to kill by killing the symbols drawn on the cave walls. Hunting magic as a theory is a bit simple, over simple. It means that one gets power over the animal that one wants to kill in the next few hours or the next day. But there may be a more, let's say, subtle explanation. It may be wanting to get in touch with the, the animal itself, which is an entity, a spirit, uh, to catch its benevolence, for example, or to ensure that the hunting will be fruitful for that animal for the year to come without bewitching one particular animal. A leading American expert on Ice Age art, Alexander Marshak, has found images that seem to refer to particular times of the year, to the seasonal appearances of certain animals. Were these images of meals, or were these symbols and metaphors that related to the way nature behaved? To the, to, the, to the rituals and the mythology of the people. Was the seal not the image only of a meal, but was it a spirit that represented the seasonal comings and goings in the ocean, the way the salmon might have represented the seasonal comings and goings as what was happening in the river after the thaw? The salmon came upriver. The birds came also seasonally, whether it's a swan or the great auk, they came seasonally to, to lay eggs. So here you have all of these different animals in one cave. And were they a meal or were they metaphors of the complexity, the lore that these people knew? Jean Clot also believes that the animal depictions are complex and can be interpreted on many different levels. Those paintings bring us lots of information. Uh, some of the information may be uh, deliberate, uh, but, and some may be implicit. Uh, for example, when they drew uh, an ibex in the Costco cave, there is a huge ibex with a very long horn. Well, that, there you have three ideas. One of them is the idea of ibex. The other one is the idea of old age, because the, the oldest they are, the longest the, the hordes are. The third idea is the idea of male. But we don't know uh, which of the three was paramount, or were the three paramount for the man who drew the ibex. In the parched outback of Australia, rock paintings have been found dating back far into the Ice Age as old as French cave art. And even today, Aboriginal artists still create rock art images using ancient techniques.
To understand these techniques and to try and learn lessons for the study of European cave art, French prehistorian Michel Loblanchet traveled to Australia. Australian uh, rock painting is a very fascinating world and um, I learned a lot from the Aboriginal painters. In fact, this is uh, action painting. The act of, of painting is as important as and sometimes more important than the result, the result on, the, on the rock. Inspired by the Aboriginal artists, Laurent Blanchet found that he could produce animal paintings startlingly similar to those in the French caves. He created this horse by blowing pigment from his mouth directly onto the rock. By blowing by mouth without any tube, any instrument, any implement, uh, I think the artist uh, projects himself projects one his being onto the rock and it's a way to become oneself a horse. So perhaps the very act of creating the images wove a powerful magic. And surely there was no place more magical than the greatest cave art sanctuary of them all. Lascaux, in France's Dordogne region. Nearly life-size images of bison, horse, wild cattle, some executed with the help of a wooden scaffolding erected against the cave walls. In all, some 600 paintings and more than 1,500 carvings decorated this sanctuary deep in the earth. Though Lascaux remains the most dazzling cave art site, it is not the most typical. Some 275 others are known, concentrated mainly in southern France and northern Spain. Some rival Lascaux's scale and grandeur, but others are far more modest, with just a few solitary images. One of the strangest activities of all took place in the cave of Gargas in the Pyrenees, where there are over 230 handprints on the wall. Just like the ones at Cosca, many show missing finger joints. Was this a ritual cult of finger mutilation? Nearly a third have the last two joints of all fingers gone, a crippling handicap for a hunter. Or what about disease such as frostbite or gangly? Could it be that they went to the cave hoping for a miracle cure? Was this a cave like Lourdes where you came because there may have been a spring nearby and you came and you put your hand on and you prayed and you asked for forgiveness or you asked for something? We don't know. Or was it just simply I was here? But if it's only I was here, why are so many of them with fingers missing? I am preparing uh, charcoal, and it's necessary to smash to the charcoal. Michel Loblanchet found that he could reproduce the sprayed appearance of the hand impressions by grinding up charcoal, mixing it with saliva in his mouth, then spitting it out on the rock, a technique still used by the Aborigines. and by folding down his fingers, he reproduces the effect of the supposed mutilations. So what did the folded fingers mean? There is also a third theory, which is that uh, they, they use their fingers as a sign language. They bend their fingers in a sort of sign language, and hunters often do that for obvious reasons when they're hunting they're going to say hey there are two bison over there you see they'll probably sign something the ethnography uh, showed that uh, mutilation and sign language uh, do exist and mainly for example in australia um, mutilation due to the sickness of the fr and the frost are difficult to prove the thumb is always preserved in the imprint of the hand, so it is hard to see how any disease could have attacked the fingers without attacking the thumb. Another mystery of the painted hands at Koska Cave is that they are often covered with scratch marks. On the hands, there are scratchings 
really forceful scratchings that uh, seem to have wanted to destroy the hands. And that is exactly what I think, that the people who came uh, 8,000 years later saw those hands that were the testimony of an ancient magic and wanted to destroy it, exactly as when in the Middle Ages in Europe, for example, uh, Roman Catholic churches were built on top of Roman temples. Marshak has also found scratchings on bone and ivory objects that he believes are not mere decoration. They look like uh, all kinds of signs, cabalistic uh, scribblings, uh, designs, patterns, and so forth. And people usually just simply dismiss that, oh, this, these are the magic scribblings of a primitive mind. But I saw patterns in these scratches. So I did all kinds of tests, and finally I came to the conclusion that they were recording the passage of time. And this is what the analysis by microscope indicated. Every change of color is a different set of marks made by a different tool. There would be a series of marks for six months. Down, then back, another series of marks for six months. Down, and another series of marks for six months. Winter solstice, summer solstice, winter solstice, summer solstice. They had a structured sense of space and time. And the caves were part of that structure. They went into the caves at the right time to make the right image. They went to their habitation site at the right time to do the right things, to make tools, to make hides for the winter, uh, to have rituals, to have ceremonies. And they weren't living at random. They were not primitive. They were us, and terribly sophisticated, though they were technologically primitive. Marshak's work continues to stir up important questions about Ice Age art and the subtlety of the minds which produced it. But much work remains to be done. Uh, it will take years and years. Uh, probably I'll be dead before we know exactly uh, what that cave means. But lots of discoveries are ahead of us. And that is, for a scientist, it's a fantastic pro uh, prospect. At Kosker Cave, it will take many years for researchers to study the nearly 100 images so far discovered there. In theory, it would be possible to bore an access tunnel down through the cliffs to make a less risky entrance to the cave. But that might disturb the delicate balance of cave chemistry that has so far preserved these images, some for an astonishing 27,000 years. On principle, I am opposed to the idea of drilling a hole to gain access to the cave. It is easier to make a diver of a scientist than a scientist out of a diver. A scientist can learn to dive and will have this dimension of discovery which I experienced. So for now, the secret treasury of Ice Age art remains protected by its formidable underwater passageway, deep beneath the surface of the Mediterranean. How astonishing that cave art's strange and haunting beauty should have come down to us across such an immense gulf of time. Most of these Ice Age people lived vulnerable lives, susceptible to disease and injury. They were lucky to survive into their 30s. Like them, their art is vulnerable, easily destroyed by vandals. Today, though, the French Navy has blocked the opening to the tunnel to protect both the fragile artworks and those who would attempt the deadly underwater ascent into the cave. Meanwhile, the quest to understand the far-off world so vividly depicted in these paintings and the engravings goes on.